Sounds great. All right. So welcome. We're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Stephanie McLaughlin, and I am the Training and Evaluation Specialist with the Partners Resource Network. Partners Resource Network is the nonprofit agency that operates the Texas statewide network of parent training and information centers. We are funded through the Department of Education Office of Special Education. Our PTI projects here in Texas are PATH, PIN, and TEAM. And at Partners Resource Network, we strive to empower and support our Texas families and individuals impacted by disabilities or special health care needs. So thank you for joining us. Also on the Partners Resource Network team is our um, Director of Statewide Services, Christina Henning, and our Support Specialist, Chelsea Rivas. And then we've got Zach Hidalgo. He's our Technology Specialist that is joining us. If you have any problems with um, any technical issues, put that in the chat box. You can reach out to Zach on there as well. So before we get started, I want to remind all of you that you are on mute and you don't have a video feed. If you want to make a comment or just chat, you can do that in the chat box. But any questions that you would like to be answered at the end by Nancy, go ahead and put that in our Q&A box and we'll do that at the end of the presentation. Uh, another thing, you will all be receiving an email tomorrow that's going to come in and a thank you for joining us today in that email will be a link where you can access a certificate of attendance if you're needing a certificate of attendance for today's webinar so you can access that tomorrow when you get that email so let me go ahead and introduce our guest speaker today so we can get to the really good information uh, thank you for joining us nancy Nancy District, Distrelic, sorry, graduated from the University of Oklahoma with a Bachelor of Arts in Early Childhood Development and Dallas Baptist University with a Master's of Arts in Teaching, Multisensory Instruction. She taught in Keller ISD for 12 years in both elementary and high school as a classroom teacher, dyslexia therapist, and special education for students with autism. She is a certified academic language therapist licensed dyslexia therapist and a member of the Academic Language Therapy Association. She's currently serving as the Region 10 Dyslexia Consultant, serving districts and students to develop the skills to become independent and confident. She offers a new perspective for teachers working with students with dyslexia. We are so glad to have you join us, Nancy. I'm going to mute my mic and turn it over to you now. Well, I first need to ask you my time frame. So we're starting now at 1222. What time would you like me to um, stop for questions? If you uh, want to speak for about 30 minutes or so okay. and do questions after that, that would be okay. So I want to tell the group first off that um, I do talk with my hands and I do talk very fast. Um, your brain will probably swirl a little bit. This is a three hour presentation that I'm going to go over in 30 minutes. So I will be very brief with the slides, but this presentation is available again through Region 10, uh, much more detail and in depth, but I, there's just too much good information for me not to expose you to it. So I will be talking quickly. Please put the questions into the chat. Um, when I first became a dyslexia therapist and the students would come to me, I'd ask them, why are you in this room? And they would say, um, I'm stupid, I, I can't read, I'm dumb. And it really wanted to change that wiring for them. And so the reason why this talk is about independence and confidence, that's the angle this presentation is for you as parents, for your child, for them to learn that they're learning abilities so that we showcase their intelligence and what they're capable of and not the focus on their deficits. So um, that's the, the point of the presentation and quickly let you know what brought me to my chair today. Um, I'm from Oklahoma and we did not uh, identify dyslexia. And so when I came to Texas as a mom, I saw my student, my son struggling and I was a parent advocate trying to get my, my son help and didn't realize that what dyslexia even was. And so watching him start off loving school, engaged in school and then slowly deteriorating in his own self-confidence and himself as a learner, did I become an advocate for dyslexia? Then I became a dyslexia therapist and learned more about my own disability and that I'm dyslexic. 
And then I became a high school dyslexia teacher. So that's why I have all the different perspectives of as a dyslexic, as a parent, and as a teacher. So that's uh, the perspectives that will be coming through the presentation. I do believe strongly that if you don't connect emotionally to someone that they can't excel academically. So we want to address what it feels like to be dyslexic. If you're tuned in today and your child was identified in first or second grade, you're gonna see less of this emotional disconnect academically for your child because we have the early identifying um, screeners and we're getting kids earlier. But if your child is after third grade, there's a, they can already tell there's a difference in their learning than their peers around them. So we'll address that today. So we're gonna talk about what is dyslexia, how the brain processes. Really briefly, I have a much uh, more in-depth presentation about that, but I wanna to get to where parents can support their kids for you today. So uh, the history of dyslexia, I started with Dr. Sally Shaywitz. She was commissioned to find out why kids weren't reading. In her book, Overcoming Dyslexia, we've known about it since 1861. It was word blindness. But over the years, we have developed a way that we know that multisensory education, explicit direct instruction is the way that we can actually change the brain. And Dr. Sally Shaywitz tells us that it's a processing disorder. So your kids, when I talk to my students about it, I let them know that it's a processing disorder that affects language, but it doesn't affect the way they're thinking. And so I like to talk to them about different operating systems, both of these computers produce, but the way that you code and get the information in and out is different and that's how their brain is working. Dr. Sally Shaywitz did functional MRI imaging, and on the non-impaired student, we have the ability to see language process. And with the dyslexic student, it will go through their frontal lobe, the right hemisphere, and over to the language center, and that processing rate is why they don't have automaticity. When they're looking and reading, they don't automatically see the word, understand it, and able to utilize it. But the good news is, is with um, explicit direct instruction, we have seen fMR imaging after uh, therapy where we have developed the language center, but they still have dyslexia. So we want to talk about um, what we're doing in those sessions. We're actually learning the science and language behind it, which I'm so proud of the state of Texas because they're having the reading academies coming to that tier one instruction. Teachers are going to be informed on how our language is designed and the rules and the structure of it, our students with dyslexia would have more explicit direct instruction on it. And these are the type of things that they learn. I quickly briefly go over, when I first went into dyslexia therapy, they asked us how many sounds A makes. I was a very strong elementary teacher, felt confident about it, and I said two. And then someone else said, no, there's three. And I was like, oh yeah, I forgot. And then they said, no, we have five sounds for this shape. So this shape, its name is A, it says apple A, ah, apron A, banana A, uh. but if you place it before an L, it says ball A. Ah. If you place this shape, its name A after a W, I don't know which way that looks on the screen, um, it's gonna say A, ah, watch A. Ah. So there's situational spelling. I was 43 years old and for the first time did I understand why I struggled to spell along with a lot of the other rules that we learned. So your child is getting exposed to how our structure of our language is. So that's what's happening. So um, Louisa Motes has told us that dyslexia is not a gift, it's a disability. But as a person who is blind, their hearing becomes more attuned, or if you're deaf, your vision becomes more attuned. Our dyslexia learners, their frontal lobe has become more attuned. And so in these areas, we're gonna talk about, this is where parents can help their kids Colors, pictures, and emotions in that frontal lobe hemisphere respond very well because they've developed it. They've got some automaticity in that frontal lobe where they can connect by visual spatial learning. And that's how we can get some of our information to our kids and we'll go into more detail at the end. This is one of my favorite slides. Uh, you can Google this down at the bottom. It says RES resources. If you Google that and then put images, you will get this chart. The reason why I utilize it is a lot of my dyslexia students will say, Mrs. D, um, I just have trouble reading. But these are all the areas that dyslexia can affect you, and each of my kids is different. And unless they understand how dyslexia affects them, they don't might maybe understand why they use their accommodations. Or a teacher might understand why this child gets this accommodation, this one gets this one. So I use this uh, for my parents during a 504 or ARD meeting. 
and we go over the areas that we see struggle for a student, and then we make sure our accommodations match it. I wanna to emphasize to parents and teachers that accommodations continually need to be adjusted or reviewed because I call it either a connection or content are the reasons why you would change an accommodation. In the high school level, a student may do, do very well in geometry, but not algebra two. And often, oftentimes when they go into the meetings, they're like, well, if you don't use your accommodation, you lose it. Well, you need to be mindful that it could be because of the subject. It also could be because of the connection. If you have a teacher who is multi-sensory by nature and she's got movies and videos and drawings and songs, your student might not be needing a lot of accommodations. And then the next year they go to a teacher who's lecture-based, which is good, they need more accommodations. So I recommend teachers and parents have this and you make documentation depending on your teacher depending on the content, when do you need the right accommodation and where are your child's specific deficits. So um, please utilize that or make a copy of it and keep that in a file. For recognizable responses, remember I talk about the emotion. Teachers, the number one way they describe a student with dyslexia, if they're, if they're not identified, is lazy. And what I have trained my students is, if you are being told you're lazy, what that really translates is your teacher sees your intellect but they don't see your progress or see your output. And so what we need to do is educate our teachers on what may be difficult for you in print. So dyslexia students are print avoiders in many situations. They don't wanna write it or read it, but they do enjoy learning it. So lazy is a word that we might say. And even as parents, we're thinking, gosh, what's their deal? We've already gone over it. Why aren't they working harder? They've got their accommodation. Then we need to ask the question, where are you having the trouble? How can I support you? Um, disrespectful, reclusive, class clown, just other ways that our kids may manifest in the classroom when they're not identified. So we want to make sure we're identifying students' remediation when they go to a therapist, but accommodations is what the majority of this presentation is about, and the experts are our parents. Because from year to year, you're going to have new principals and new teachers, but the parent's the one that needs to understand what accommodations are working and why they need them. I also want to tell you that you want your child to sometimes be uncomfortable so that they can develop strength and face what is difficult. If we have so many accommodations, they may struggle later on when they get into secondary or post-secondary education. So we wanna develop skills, not just fully accommodate where they feel like they need more. So we're gonna switch gears a little bit on how the brain processes. This is all students. Dr. David Sousa, this is one of my favorite series on how the brain learns. And if you're interested in other areas, he has how the brain learns math, EL, GT, lots of different areas. So he is a great resource. He takes the same research, but applies it in different ways. But the, what I took out of it as a dyslexia therapist is how he talked about the brain's process. Since dyslexia is a processing disorder. And so he says the brain is seeking novelty. So we're always looking around for new information. The brain automatically will pattern that for you. So if I say cat, some of you don't like them, some love them, some are indifferent, and some are allergic. Your brain knows how to sift or sort the word cat for you. The reason why is it has to protect itself. For some of us, different situations are exciting. For someone else, it's cautious because it needs to protect. And the brain's goal is to have automaticity. That means when information is coming in, I can sort it quickly so I can have more novelty. So on your way to work, you're able to drive while you're listening to music, thinking about what you need to do and possibly hands-free talking on the phone. It's because driving to work is automatic for you. If you're going somewhere new, then you're looking at the signs, you're listening to Siri, and you're having to concentrate on that. And the brain would be firing in lots of different ways for new learning. So the goal of the brain is to seek new, pattern, protect with automaticity. Here's what's exciting for me. All of that process is done chemically. And I never really thought about that all my thoughts could be tangible or controllable. And so here's our next model from Dr. David Sousa. He's letting us know that when environmental information is coming in, I immediately have to know if I'm okay. Am I in fight or flight or am I good? So that input right there where it's going out, it's saying I'm good, the environment's safe, I like where I am, I'm good. So things are deleting. 
at that point, that is that processing it at the brain where it is taking in that new novelty and patterning for you. If it does not develop, then you have ADD or ADHD. This is a student who cannot automatically process stimulation coming in. So they have to think about what they need and what they don't need. So information is coming into immediate memory. Actually, this is an immediate memory. In immediate memory, that's where your brain sorts. It deletes information it doesn't need. So right now, like behind me, there's a picture of flowers. Your brain probably saw it, but it knew it didn't need it. It deleted it without you even thinking about it. But if you stay tuned in today because you want to know about dyslexia, you're engaged and you're listening. And if you like what I have to say, you want to learn more, you're switching it over to your working memory. Inside your working memory is where you take information and you process and think about it. Huh, I think this will work with my child. Oh, that's interesting that my child did that last year. So this is where you're utilizing it. In this stage, you're still deleting information that you don't think you need and keeping what you want. And an example of that, there's a gorilla video um, on memory and they have a whole bunch of teenagers in black sweats and you're asked to count the basketballs, how many times they drop. So you're counting them. The next slide says, did you see the gorilla? I didn't see a gorilla. They have you rewatch it and there is a man in a gorilla suit walking in between each of the students bouncing the basketball. What happened is your brain was focused on the basketball and so it didn't see the other information coming in, it was deleting it. The reason why that's significant to me is when you're dyslexia students in class and they're concentrating on decoding, they didn't hear the teacher say, turn the page. They didn't hear the teacher say, I need you to write that down or the note on the board is telling you that's on the test. And so our students are saying, the teacher you know, may say, well, I need you to listen, I need you to pay attention. Well, they're hyper-focusing on what they need and they may not be taking in all the information around them. That's significant. So if I'm giving you information today, you're choosing to listen, you're working with it like, hey, that might, that's, I described your child. And then you take what I told you today and you actually implement it in your household. That's now in your long-term memory. So that's how memory works. But here's what was more significant to me when I learned about the processing model. There's two types of chemicals that are part of this process. Positive chemicals called endorphins and negative stress hormones, cortisol. When you have endorphins and good horm hormones coming through your body, long-term memory opens up and says, this is good for you. Your blood pressure's right, your pu pu pupils are right, everything is going well for you. I want more information, this is good. When you're stressed, cortisol says, no, 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 this is bad, you're not okay. And it shuts down long-term memory and says, you can't come in. This is an example of test anxiety. My son who struggled in school, he could do a spelling test Wednesday night sitting on my lap with his pajamas on. He knew every single word. But then on Friday when he took that test, he could he shut down. Now I understand what was happening is in my home, he had endorphins, he was relaxed, and he could access that information in long-term memory. But on the day of the test, he was so afraid of failing, so afraid of being pointed out, so afraid of not doing what he knew he could do, that he blocked out long-term memory and could access information. When you're in cortisol over a long period of time, that stress hormone at school, it becomes a negative emotion and school becomes something that is not, um, you can't access information and gain that knowledge because you're stressed. So I want to, I, I go into more depth on uh, different presentations, but this model is what brings me to the rest of this presentation. I need to change the mindset for my students so they build confidence in themselves, recognize they have an area to grow, but don't hyper-focus on a deficit. My example, I give my kids on glasses. If I had started off my presentation apologizing I was wearing glasses, many of you would think that was strange. If I was like, I'm so sorry, I'm nearsighted, I've had my glasses since I was two, I can't see. It, most people wear them, you would think that was a waste of time. But if I didn't wear them and I couldn't see my presentation or if we were face to face and I bumped into you, I'd be unprofessional. So I tell my students with dyslexia, you have a disability that affects reading and spelling but we're gonna ask you to take ownership of it. There's so many other parts of you that are strong, we're gonna concentrate on that as well. And that's how we're gonna build the independence and confidence. So when we talk about education, the very first rung of education, they have to feel secure. And they don't just feel secure because they're eating right and getting good sleep and they're in a safe home environment. They need to feel emotionally safe at school. 
So executive function is those chemicals in the brain that are helping them process information. It is real. And some of our kids have dyslexia, also have ADHD or ADD. And those chemicals are getting in the way of them holding information, utilizing it, and being responsible at school. Not because of their character, but because their chemicals are having a hard time taking in the information and using it. So what I've had our teachers and our parents talk about are these three components of emotion. Metacognition is when my students only have dyslexia and they don't overweigh it. It's not something they need to be ashamed of. It's not something they need to be proud of. It's just a part of who they are and we're gonna give them the support that they need so that they can become uh, the learners and the people they meant to be. When my students know they have dyslexia, they recognize the support they need, they don't make excuses, but they take the responsibility, that's self-actualization. I have confident students. One of my favorite things I tell my students, I want you to be uncomfortably confident. So when they come to a word they don't know, I just say, oh, that looks like that's a, that's a hard word. And they're like, yeah, I'm like, yeah, that would be a hard word for me. Let's see if we can break it down. But I want you to read it with confidence. Just say, I don't know that word yet. Changing their mentality and how they feel about themselves is actually changing that chemical balance that they're getting in their mind so they can learn and gain information. When my students recognize what dyslexia is for them, how they can gain the right support, then I have self-esteem. That's a completely different learner if they are independent and confident, recognize what dyslexia is for them, and they can take on what they need to be successful. The gift I give myself and everyone else is this slide. Uh, we had in our district when the, there were mass shootings and the students kind of stood up, the, the one in Florida, our district really wanted to take a stance. And so they brought in mindfulness teachers and several yoga instructors and just talked to us about how do we stay calm. And I, I do subscribe to this. I have this poster in my classroom. And so anytime my students are overwhelmed or frustrated and feel like their homework is too much or the teachers are, hate them, by the way, students will say, my teacher hates me. That really means and translates, I'm struggling in the class. And so I've also taught my kids how to engage that way, but three-hour presentation can't go into that one. So this is the breathing square. And so what you're doing when you teach a child and yourself to breathe, you're actually releasing cortisol and you're relaxing the muscles. And then the student can access their knowledge in that long-term memory. So this is powerful before STAR. It's powerful before if you guys struggle when you do homework, you both take a breath. It's a good thing that you can incorporate in any situation, but I tell my students, when you're stressed, you're gonna feel it in your head, your stomach, or in your muscles. And if you're feeling it, I need you to relax a little bit before we can get to the academics. So the breathing square is a great way for you guys to implement that at home and do it between yourselves. If you feel your shoulders are going up, <sighs> Now you both can respond to a situation instead of react. So your students need you to model that with academics. So this is just letting you know that the power of a positive attitude is not just a feel good. It's chemical and it will change the academic outcome of your student, your child. So we want to make sure that we have genuine feedback when you overpraise a child and say, you're awesome. What does that mean? It changes the credibility. If you say, I recognize that you read more pages than you did the night before. Hey, your fluency is increasing. Did you recognize that you're changing how you spell that word? Great job. Real praise, genuine praise helps your student have a good attitude. And when I let my kids know that attitude controls the brain, not the brain controls the attitude, that is the empowerment. When they're going into a test and they're feeling freaked out, I'm like, well, you can feel something else if you want to. You can feel confident. You can verbalize what you need. You can ask for accommodations. But I do know that if you go in there calm and confident, you will perform better than if you go in there stressed and overwhelmed. We'll learn if we needed to study. We'll learn to communicate with the teacher. But go in there and feel good about it. You're in control of your emotion, which changes how you access information. Remember, it's a processing disorder, and giving them that empowerment makes a stronger kid. Um, one of the ways that we've empowered kids is we have a mentor program, and I will go into detail on that at a different time, but I do believe that when students are hearing other kids going through the same thing, it makes them feel better. I was 43 when I realized I had dyslexia, and I felt better because for the first time I realized, you mean 
other people struggle with spelling that word, other people struggle to read that word. I just was hiding it in shame that I didn't want anyone to know I was stupid. And now the mentor program, we have high school kids go down to elementary kids or elementary kids working with each other. And when they get together and see that these are creative, outgoing uh, kids in every different uh, type of group at school, you know, you've got your athletes, your singers, your all, all kinds of kids, they all have dyslexia. And so it builds that social confidence for the kids. So I do recommend a um, dyslexia program, a uh, mentor program. And those are only successful when you have strong parent groups. So that's, I would love to give you more information on our mentor program and how you can build that uh, relationship. So this is the big meat of what I wanted to get to today. How do parents support these kids? How do they build that independence and confidence? Well, this, you may have seen this slide. It's usually uh, used for STAR. For a fair selection, everybody has to take the same exam. Please climb that tree. Well, of course, you know, I can tell you about STAR that for a dyslexia student, that sometimes is a nightmare. Um, if they've struggled in an area, then they're assessed in it. I had a student that said the fish can climb the tree. And I said, how? And she said, turn, put the tree sideways in a river. So I take this to all my, my meetings, my 504 meetings, and I tell my parents, I am not changing my expectation for your child. It's just gonna look different how we get there. So I love using that poster and encourage my parents to do the same thing when you partner with your schools. Their goal is your goal. They want your child to have progress, both emotionally and academically, and we wanna be aligned together. So please make sure you're a parent that has a binder. If you're tuning in, you probably are the parent with the binder, I was. And every time you have that identification, if you have um, their uh, accommodations from each year, their 504, their IEP, be making notes, talk to your child about what they need. My kids, uh, their freshman year, very intimidated about this. They're like, they all go in there and just talk about what I don't do right. So what's powerful is by their senior year, junior year, my high school students were doing their dyslexia portion for themselves. They were able to know what they needed, why they need it, and sit back confidently and know they're advocating because they deserved for their intelligence to be challenged and for them to showcase what they could do. So make sure that you do that. Going to trainings is great. Make sure you're part of their meetings and always uh, be communicating with other parents because you learn from each other and you're stronger as a group. Um, also, I have on our news, uh, Region 10 website, I have parent newsletters and I have videos and tutorials of what I'm gonna be talking about from here on. I have an example for you to follow and it goes much slower. Uh, so if you wanna connect with those and inspiring stories. The other thing I wanted to talk to parents about is we have a newsletter uh, on, um, not a newsletter, we have an informative letter from our librarian that you can take at a 504 meeting. The librarian is not a teacher of record. And we don't include her in those 504 art meetings. And she is so important because the librarian, this is a room in the building that students with dyslexia tend to avoid and that we have so many resources in there. But I can tell you as a child, when the teacher, the librarian was telling me where to go in the library, I just chose to make that a place to play tag and hide and seek. Um, but the librarian can be your resource and be your friend. So make that connection with her. She will not, not or he may not know your child has dyslexia. And they verbally are just like all the other kids, and they won't know how to connect them to the right books or to get them involved in audiobooks. So reach out to your librarian, make them be a partner. When I was at the high school level, we actually had a pass, and we met the librarian on our own as our own dyslexia class. We met her, and she said, If you're one of Mrs. D's kids, then I will personally support you. And only a few of my kids, if you don't need an accommodation, I don't give them to them. But a few of my kids had a card, and if they handed it to her, then that meant she would pull their books for them. So there's a little tiny way for our kids to feel like they've got the support they need. And I don't want to give them support that they don't need. I want my kids challenged and growing, even out of their comfort level. But for some of our kids, that librarian relationship needs to be established. Technology, I cannot tell you enough how vital it is for a kid to have audiobooks. Immersive reader, I'm going to talk to you later about that, and I have tutorials. That is where the computer reads for your student. It changes the font, changes the spacing. I can tell you at my age, when I first saw that I could change the distance between the lines and it could read to me, it changed the game. I can read, but I don't read quickly. And it was so much nicer to have something read to me. So your students will benefit from having audiobooks. 
and on audiobooks, it's not just because I can hear doesn't mean I know how to do an audiobook. You have to build the audio stamina. So when a student is six, I'd only have them listen for three minutes, stop the recording and say, what did you hear? You've got to look for check for understanding and slowly build their listening stamina until they can listen to a page, a chapter, and then a book on their own. So don't just say, oh, my kid can't do audiobooks. You need to teach them. This right here, of uh, the whole slide presentation, it's one of my favorite slides. Doc, um, Nancy Watson is a must. If you've not heard her speak, go to any session she can. She's a Google innovator. And I asked her to put the top technology tools that benefit students with dyslexia. So if you go to that site, those are listed. Then if you're a guru, she has another uh, tab at the bottom for many, many, many other extensions. She um, highlights ones that are free, and she also highlights the different technology tools that you can utilize them from. So please check out that website. Um, it's, it's important for your kids. So audiobooks, I've talked to you about the importance of those. I tend to talk over my own slides. This is our audiobook poster series. Uh, it did win a gold recognized medal for the state of Texas through TEA um, for our elementary, middle, and high. Really encourage uh, parents once we get back into schools that we make it normal to do audiobooks. We make it a part of the section in the library and we encourage our kids so that way they feel normal picking out an audiobook. I loved when my brothers, they, they read, their avid readers, and they would send me books, but I didn't want to, I, I just couldn't get through them. They were too thick for me. So when I realized I was dyslexic, my brother would send it to me by audiobook. I could have the same conversation, quote the book, talk about it, connect and relate with it. So please encourage that with your students. Speech to text. That's an interesting one because we've talked a lot in our handbook, we've added dysgraphia. And a lot of dysgraphia is actually dystichia. We took handwriting out of our teeks. And so a lot of kids actually just have poor um, habits. Either poor habit or if it is dysgraphia, which is related to dyslexia, there is an option of speech to text. You wanna make sure your child is developing the skill of print and you wanna make sure that they have that practice. But speech to text also acknowledges that when you're dyslexic, grammar and semantics may be difficult. And your child's doing okay in third and fourth grade, but once we get to middle school and high school and the papers are extended, your child may struggle with the spelling and semantics. So having a speech to text is a tool for your child to watch their print and their speech. It helps them with the stamina of writing. And so it's an additional tool. It is not to supplement or take away from learning writing, but it is a tool for your child to become confident that what they have to say then on print is the same thing. I love putting my students in front of speech to text, the younger ones, and for the first time, them watching what they say on the page. I've also used it to kids who don't enjoy reading and they just talk out loud and see what they wrote. And they're like, hey, that's what I said. I'm like, that's all print is. And I understand because I used to not want to do print either until I realized it was just talking on paper. So this is a great way for your child to connect, how to tell story, and then realize that writing is something to embrace and not be afraid of. So I like it just for a fun tool. I use it inside of therapy, but then in the middle school and high school, it was a tool for my kids for their papers. Not all of them, but kids who needed it. So please start exploring speech to text for your child. Confidence builders with part to whole. Dyslexia students have difficulty with part. They're big picture thinker and they understand whole, but they have trouble seeing the little parts. That's why when they read, they will memorize through their frontal lobe and can read refrigerator. But they may have trouble reading the word of. So these are activities. Uh, the qubits is like an IQ game because it's shape and spatial reasoning. If this, then what's next? And so it's a great activity you can just play at home and they don't realize they're developing part to whole skills. Drawing, if your kids are younger, under fourth grade, although high school kids do this too, um, they might not be able to draw a line and they'll say, oh, Mrs. D, I can't draw that. Okay, I'll agree with you. That might be challenging, but let's, let's, let's break it down into parts and see what you can do. Well, the reason why I'm doing this is when I show my, my students, you can do stuff if you break it down. They're not as overwhelmed. So I teach this skill regularly inside the class in a safe environment, consistent. So then we have an assignment that's six parts. I'll say, wow, you look overwhelmed, kind of like when we drew that line. Let's see how we can break this down into parts 
and then I feel confident that you'll be able to do each part. Dyslexic kids get overwhelmed because there's so much coming at them. Remember, they're focusing on that even decoding that they get overwhelmed with all the other stimulation. The IQ challenge and art, um, if you'll just Google those online, it's kind of like finding Waldo with shapes, but then they integrate letters and numbers. And it's just activities that your kid thinks they're having fun in the back, back seat of the car, but they're actually developing skills to discern shape and letters. So those are some activities that you can develop part to whole. So when I talked about color, pictures, and emotion, that frontal lobe, here is the most powerful thing. Our handbook tells you that transparencies do not help with dyslexia. That is true. Your child will not decode better if they are using a transparency. However, it will help with organization, highlighting, and um, stamina of reading because now they're able to focus. So the example I have on this page, when it is just black pen, print on white paper, the students will be like, this is too much, this is too hard, I can't do it, emotion. So what I do is I teach my students how to break it down. Okay, I see that that's overwhelming. Let's see if we take all of this whole and break it into little parts. See where it's bolded here, let's highlight and read what that is. Okay, that's a different section. Let's just learn this section right now. I taught my students to take a deep breath, break it into parts, and then overcome it. And I will tell you, I am the same way with um, COVID-19. As soon as we had to go virtual, I got so overwhelmed, completely overwhelmed. I did not think I could do my job because it's reading email and things are coming. I'm not face to face with people, which is my way to learn. And all I did is I took a deep breath, broke it into parts, printed stuff out and highlighted it. And I was able to overcome it. Dyslexia doesn't go away but I, my strategies empowered me where I'm independent and confident. Here's some examples too that I've used with my younger kids. I'll go through a page, there's no rhyme or reason. I highlight different depending on my student and what their need is, but I give them the opportunity to just talk about reading with me. Um, I want them to tell me, man, Mrs. D, I don't wanna read that word. And I'm like, it's probably too big, right? I'm like, yeah, and I was like, I wouldn't wanna read it either. Let's just skip that one. This isn't a writing assignment. This is just my student explaining to me what words they like and don't like. Remember, it's just emotion again. And you learn a lot from a kid when you just say, tell me what you think about this page. What words do you wanna read? What words stick out to you? And I learn where my kids are struggling and they learn that they could verbalize what they feel about reading. That is a part of them moving forward academically if they understand how they feel about it in the first place. When you're sitting around a lot of kids who can read, they don't understand that it hurts to do it. Here's another example of using highlighters. Yes, money. It's still symbol and we have to look at it and discern what it looks like. So I quickly will go through and highlight the coins. That way they build that speed and confidence because they can see the color and they can discern the information. Parents, this is one of my favorite things and I call this my salt strategies. The reason why is because if I'm making taco night dinner, taco dinner, and I've made the meat, take a bite, Put in a little bit of salt, take a bite. Took two seconds and now dinner's ready. It was so easy, but it made a difference on whether the family was gonna like dinner. What I'm about to tell you is so easy and simple that a lot of my parents don't do it, but it makes a big significant difference. The number one thing is if you notice the line on the page. The reason why the line is significant is because if I am your boss, and I come in and I gave you 13 things I need you to do. You're overwhelmed. But if I come in and I say, you know what? I feel, I believe in you and I know you accomplished things. Here's two things. Let's revisit this in two weeks and then go from there. You're like, yeah, I love working here. When you draw that line, you're not saying, uh, when the line's not there and teachers say, just do as much as you can and then we'll check your paper. That's saying all the other kids can do the paper. We know you can't. The line says, I know you're intelligent. All I need to know is do you understand the concept? I just need to know that with two questions. We'll go further if we choose to. That student now isn't overwhelmed. They fully concentrate on the two questions and they achieve it. Generally, they do so much better because there's less stress that they can complete the page. But that line is powerful because you're showing that kid you know they're smart, they learn different, and this works for them. 
And again, the strategies I show you from here on is not for all kids with dyslexia. It's for your kid where you see them struggle. So don't just incorporate this because I said it today. Know if it's right for your kid. Some kids don't need this. The other thing you notice that um, the questions are yellow. I will ask my kid, actually I have my, my tub right here. So, for me. so this is how I organize my life because I cannot do anything without highlighters. And so the first thing I do with my students is I pull out the highlighters and say, what color do you see a question? Oh, you see it yellow. Every kid's gonna have a color and they'll say, they'll know what they want. Okay, so I would highlight the questions yellow every time. That helped your child with stamina because now they don't have to look for the question and they don't have to know there's a lot of reading the questions in yellow. Then if it's a chart, I already highlighted the word from the chart in the page and that way my student knows I don't have to read the word peaches, green was peaches. So these are the ways that you can help your child's stamina. And the last page is just like I told you, when they get a page and they're overwhelmed, I broke it into parts with the color. That's how you say, we've got this. You know what? And then you can draw a line and say, let's do these two first questions. Go have a snack. We'll finish the other two later. How am I doing on time? We're right at one o'clock right now. Okay. Whoa. Okay. <laughs> But, but we don't have anything scheduled, so if you have the time, we can certainly we can certainly go. Because this is I, I have a it's been a, it's a great presentation, and we're getting a great response from parents. So please feel free to to continue. Okay, my apologies, parents. I'm this is a three hour presentation, so it's pretty the fastest I've ever done it. I have probably probably eight to ten more slides, so if, if that's okay. And this is being recorded, and so if anyone has to leave, if any of you um, viewing today have to leave, um, you can go back on our website and you can catch this uh, recording afterwards. So thanks, Nancy. Thank you. And then through Region 10, we'll be offering this throughout the entire summer, and it will be general classroom strategies. Um, and now, just because you said that, maybe I'll do a parent one for Region 10. I'll, I'll check that out. So the frontal lobe also needs pictures. Anytime your child can picture something, that's how they can connect. So when I taught algebra to a high school student that plays football, I did all the algebra in a football analogy and he could see what I meant by what the numbers were doing. Um, increased font size is another visual for your students to picture things, it just makes it bigger. Anytime, if your student's in middle school or high school, I, not every dyslexic kid, if they're struggling, then I'll go to the teacher and ask if we can see the movie ahead of time and maybe even like read spark notes. But I have ways for the teacher, I'll say, are you looking at their reading fluency or are you wanting them to have comprehension and application? What is your goal for this book? Oh, I want them to know Great Gatsby and the simmer, symmetry, the uh, similes and um, you know whatever the literature that they want them to know. If that's their goal, then I adjust the reading. And so um, that's powerful. And then at the bottom, it says memorize one, remember two. Dyslexic kids will re flip flop things, they'll get confused. So if um, I have a student who, uh, many, many of my dyslexic students know that the Pacific and Atlantic Ocean border the United States, but they forget which one's on which side. And they, they're like, I know, Mrs. D, I just forget. I said, All right, just memorize one of them. So I said, Which side of the America was discovered first? Okay. What's the first letter of the alphabet? <gasps> so if you know that's Atlantic, oh, that's Pacific. I'm like, there you go. So anytime your student's having trouble with two different concepts that go together, have them memorize one of them and now they know both. So that's another, another cool page, thoughts on there. This is for my elementary teacher or elementary students, um, sight words. Your student can read refrigerator because their frontal lobe can see the pattern of it and make sense to them and they know what a refrigerator is but they struggle to read sight words like of, what is an of? So this is a sight word book that um, my students develop and I, most uh, reading at the young age, most readers, 85, 80, 75 to 80% of all the words are sight words. So you see your child struggling with fluency, it's actually the sight words. And so this book, I have my students use a Dolch or Fry's list and I have two lines out beside each word and whenever they read the word, they get a, a check mark for reading it. And here's an example of a student reading the word this. The, the, I, the, I, the, this? That was a great read. So they get one check mark. And then I tell them, 
That was knowing how to read it, but now we're gonna work on saying it as fast as you say your name. It's the rate you say it. So what happens is we teach our kids their sight words, like my kid knows their sight words, but they need to know them quickly. So what I do is on the word that they're, they can read, but they don't read it quickly, they have a note card and they'll write it on there and then they write this um, sight word book. And what I require for my students that I teach is an athlete warms up their muscles, a choir student warms up their vocals, and a dyslexia student warms up their left hemisphere. So they have to do their sight words and read their sight word book every time before they read. And eventually those sight words become easy. That's 75% of the words on their page. That's increased their fluency, comprehension, and confidence in reading. So I highly recommend that. And I have a tutorial on it, so you can go in detail on that. Parents, 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 parents. This is my favorite thing. Banish Boring Words, and the reason why Thrift Books is on there is it, you can get it for much cheaper if you go to Thrift Books. This is an accommodation that I do have for my students on their accommodations, because if they can carry it from year to year to year, then they're developing the skills. Here's what's hard as a dyslexic kid. The teachers will say, if you can't spell that word, looking up in the dictionary. Okay. Circle is not in the S's, right? So that's hard for us. And then a thesaurus, once they get middle school and high school, they ask us to look in a thesaurus. Well, that gave me a whole bunch of more words to read. It's really hard for me. It takes time. If they have this notebook, this workbook with them, we highlight it inside it and the words that they use in their sentences when they're speaking. Hey, I've noticed that you use the word peculiar. Can you spell it? Mrs. D. I'm just saying it's in here and I'm going to, what color do you want to highlight it? Okay. When you want to use that in your writing, it's right here in your book. I don't make them know all the book. They just know the words that they need and they can carry it from year to year to have it. Then on star, you can have a word list. And I have my kids develop their word list from the words that they use all the time in their speech. And then they know how to spell it. So I think it's a powerful tool. Uh, tool and when they get into middle school and high school and they have to do adjectives, adverbs, juicy sentences, similes, it's all in there. So that is one of the best purchases I can recommend for my, for my parents. Frontal lobe spelling. Uh, a lot of kids, I can't spell restaurant unless I see it. Uh, this is by um, Van Alstein and these are cards on how to see spelling words. So Wednesday is Wednesday. So great tool for parents. More information, you'll have that in the slides. Emotions, I've kind of gone over that. Anytime that you can make something emotional, your kids can relate to it, making stories. Math, many kids with dyslexia do not struggle in math, but they might struggle with remembering like the symbols, so I'll have them highlight or holding on to the facts. So this is by uh, Chris Wooden. It's multiplication division facts for the whole department. Remember I told you they are great whole thinkers. They have struggled with the parts. Great book for kids. Make sure you set up a great homework environment, um, make it consistent, allow them to have choices, allow technology, and make it positive. I would set a time limit. Whatever age your child is, you don't want to go over that section without asking them if they can. If homework's taking two hours, you need a phone call to the teacher and say, how long should this assignment take? Oh, maybe 15 minutes. It's two hours for us. So you need to make sure that you have that in homework environment is adjusted to their age and that you've communicated with the teacher what is right for them. They shouldn't be doing homework more than what is expected. So that's the adults um, advocating. So this is my last slide. This is a student that I received. He was in fifth grade and on the left, April of 2017, that was his independent writing. Um, he knew he was not bright. He, felt, he knew he was different than the other kids. Um, they did not put him in a dyslexia program, even though he was dyslexic. And so the first six sessions, we did not work on anything with letters. We worked on his confidence. We worked on the emotion. We worked on who he was as an intellect. Seven months later, this is his independent writing on the right. And the reason why is not because I'm this great teacher. I have great resources and I'm able to work with him. But it's because he finally understood that he was in control and empowered. He had the strategies to improve, and he had the intellect to understand it. The other reason why there's progress here is not because I'm a great teacher. This is once a week. It was a parent. A parent chose to do the things that I was saying, this will work if you are consistent with your child. He will make the progress if you support him. So parents, you are vital. And if you look at the beginning of our programs, it will say, 
the progress of a student is in relationship to the involvement of the parent. You are powerful advocates and your student's progress to, is uh, dependent upon you. So life isn't about waiting for the storm to pass, it's learning to dance in the rain. So I'm so grateful to be a part of parents that want to make that improvement and are advocating for their kids. You are an ally with your schools. I hope you're not needing to fight the school. Sometimes we have to fight, but we're advocating and we're making it better for the other kids. The information resources that I talked about today are available in the presentation. And thank you for having me. Thank you so much. Such great information, uh, Nancy. We appreciate that. Just a reminder, if you have a question, if you will put that question in the Q&A box and not the chat box, we're going to look at the questions in the Q&A box. Uh, we did receive a couple of questions through email, so I'm going to look at those first, uh, if you don't mind. So, Nancy, as the brain changes with each of the child's developmental stages, as they age, how does teaching a child with a disability such as dyslexia change? If you're asking how, well, I, I'm gonna have two parts in there. If you're asking how is the development changing according to like language, if they're in a therapy, we have fMRI imaging to show that they develop the ability to see sounds and develop phonemic awareness. So that's how their brain is developing if they're in therapy. The other way that they're developing is chemically with that confidence, uh, your brain is wiring itself with patterns. So uh, Dr. Sally Shaywitz, I think, um, not Sally Shaywitz, sorry, um, Switch on Your Brain, the book that I have right there, um, it, that one does have a Christian references to it, and she now, Dr. Carolyn Leaf, has a book, Secular, and she's saying it's like if you were um, on a lawn and you're walking back and forth to your neighbor's house, where you walk all the time, it's worn. And so when we tell ourselves over and over the same thing, man, I'm stupid, man, I'm stupid, man, I'm stupid, or I can't do that, I can't do that, you're wiring yourself for that. And so when you rewire yourself that you're confident and independent, you're a problem solver, you can utilize strategies and you have support and you're an advocate, you are rewiring the brain and becoming confident and these kids are able to problem solve and move forward in a positive way. So if that's what your question is asking, I think the brain can rewire itself to handle situations. Excellent. So we had a parent that asked, does a child outgrow dyslexia? Or how does it get better with special education? That's a, actually that one of the saddest things. I was at a um, parent night and a little girl in second grade came up and she said, I don't want to wake up with dyslexia anymore. Will it go away? And I said, well, it doesn't go away, but what you can do is acknowledge what you are, have been given as your intellect and your creativity, and you can access it, and you can overcome the challenges. So um, I still struggle with dyslexia, um, and I don't have time today to tell you all the different stories, but I still struggle with it. The difference now for myself is I have strategies when I enter a situation. I now know to say, Nancy, okay, what am I gonna be looking for? What are my details? Okay, who am I gonna go with that might give me some support? So I know how to navigate my environment so I can move forward with confidence instead of feeling overwhelmed, anxious, stupid, all the things that I used to tell myself. So I do believe like that student that you saw, his trajectory changed when he knew he had independence. And to let you know, when your kids hit middle school and high school, they're wanting to show their parents developmentally, I've got this. And when you're still needing support and to advocate for yourself, there's, there's a struggle. So they're wanting their parent not to help them because they're trying to show you I'm independent. So you want to build in strategies so that they know how to be confident with the dyslexia and how they are independent, immersive reader. When the computer can read for them, they don't have to go get mommy to read. So they still have it but it can become a positive thing and not be something that's a hindering them from their potential. Excellent. All right, so do you have any tips to support a student in high school with phonics and reading fluency? So I became a high school dyslexia teacher and I will, it is, first I had to develop a relationship with my kids where they felt like I was not invading any um, space of insecurity. They don't want to show me that they don't read well or that they have low fluency. So I had to first have that relationship. Once I had that space where they felt like they could say, Mrs. D, oh my gosh, look how hard this is, or look what I did. 
when I knew we were in a safe space, I did use the strategies that I showed you earlier that I use with elementary kids. And I told them, Mrs. D's no different. I have dyslexia and here's where, you know, you know, depending on the kid, I'd be like, you know how well you can draw and it comes natural to you. So you have strengths, but right here, just like Mrs. D, I have a hard time with this word. So we're gonna go over sight words. And so I literally have them identify what it is where their need is. Another thing I've done with high school kids is I have them record themselves reading and I let them hear the difference between how they say it and how they're able to think it. Because if I'm reading to them, they've got fluency, right? They can comprehend, but it's the decoding of the word. So I slowly, and I hate to say this, but it depends on my kid what I do, but the student that I'm working with, I find what is their interest. I teach inside of their interest. So if they love horses or superheroes, football, whatever it is, I go through a route that's already wired in their brain. I develop phonemic awareness inside of that. I let them hear themselves, engage themselves. And I also have my students see where their fluency is and I let them set their own goal. Where do you wanna be? Where do you, and I let them know, I'm very real with them. This is what a typical fourth grader reads at. Here's where an eighth grader reads. Here's where a senior reads. We have dyslexia, so we're gonna read probably a little bit less than the norm, but where would you like to be? And we slowly develop those skills and I let them take the ownership of it. So yeah, you, you can build it in high school, but it's a very, that's a harder place for a parent at high school than it is for the teacher because they're wanting mom and dad to see them as independent. So it, it is harder as a parent. Excellent. So a parent said they have a second grader that really struggles to read. She gets frustrated, will start to cry if she gets something wrong more than once. And she has a kindergarten sister that reads better than her. So what are some strategies to, that the parent can use to help the child calm down and improve her reading skills as they prepare for third grade? I will, that is one of my number one questions and it is a, a lot of times when a younger sibling is reading stronger and that's when the emotional start part, the emotional part starts. They now recognize that they're different. They already knew they were different from the kids in the classroom, but now their younger sibling is doing better than them. So that's that emotional piece. So that's when I came in with that other student. We started talking about what they're able to do and what dyslexia really is, and that it is a part of the brain that is not connecting. And one of the examples I would give my students is I could do a standing back flip. And I was like, can everybody at this building do a standing back flip? No, I can. So just to kind of give my students different brains are different wired, differently wired. And so I start building their confidence in what they can do. And then I put dyslexia in a real place. I don't make it terrible and I don't make it something to ignore. I just say, so let's look at these words, the way your brain is seeing that word and let's walk through it. And I will, gosh, I wish I could one-on-one. -on -one. I have longer time to go through and uh, whoever asked that question, I'd like you to actually call me. Um, my information's available because the strategy for the sight word process when those kids who struggle to read, when 75% are sight words and you can build that confidence, then on a page there's only three words they don't know. We learn how to decode them. They really start building their confidence. So um, I have lots of things to say that that would be longer than this time. So please reach out to me for more strategies, but working on sight words, working on their confidence and getting, I'm sorry, there's so much. And then also getting them books. I have two different baskets. One basket is your reading level. And with dyslexia, that's, these are good books. And then here's your intellectual level. And I have those on audiobooks, and mom's going to read them to you because I know you're ready for chapter books. So that also helps your child know that you're not reading easy reader. And when they go to the library, oftentimes they've got them on the easy readers. And that's hard for them when they're intelligent and they know they can do more. So there's lots of strategies for your second grader so that she feels confident going to school and doesn't cry to read, but starts loving it. So um, please reach out to me personally. Excellent. So we had a question about some star accommodations for dyslexic students. Is there accommodations to read the text to a student? Uh, no, the accommodation for star is that they can read the answer choice to you. Um, and so I, the way I address star for my students is I tell them that the adults in your life have a piece of paper called a 504 and we already know you have a reading disability. But this assessment is asking you to read. So for you, 
the STAR assessment is a progress monitoring piece. I want you to go in there and show that you have increased your ability, that you're confident in what you're doing, and we're gonna utilize those strategies. When I take that pressure, remember emotion, when I take that pressure off my kids and tell them I'm not worried about STAR, I wanna know that you are intelligent, capable, confident, independent. My students' scores increased on STAR because what happens, including myself, just going to the STAR exam test, just finding my room because it's different than my routine, I'm already stressed. Then you get in there and the proctor happens to be one of the coaches that you want to impress and you're going to be the last one to finish your test. I'm stressed. Remember I told you earlier, that stress, I can't access long-term memory and now I'm overwhelmed and I can't do STAR. I have found an increase in my STAR by changing their attitude about the STAR day and I actually have a lot more STAR strategies that I use for my kids that is emotional. Um, strategies for them to physically to access how to go to the test and use their and use the strategies we've learned in the classroom. So I have a whole nother um, hour presentation on STAR strategies. So yes, they can um, increase their progress on STAR. Um, yes, they need to know how to use their accommodations prior to that test and practice it before the test. Um, but no, they cannot have it read to them. Excellent. We also have some people that have requested resources in Spanish. Do you have resources available on your website? We have less in Spanish, but we are in the process of converting that. And so we do have the State Dyslexia Handbook. There's going to be a Spanish version. We have a parent brochure that's in Spanish. Um, we have had interpreters come to some of our parent nights, which has been very beneficial. Uh, but most of the materials have not been translated. Thank you. And we've had a number of parents asking if there are resources for tutoring for dyslexia. So how would you recommend, because we're all across the state, how would you recommend parents um, access or look into tutoring for their student with dyslexia? If they're looking for a certified academic language therapist, the ALTA website, A-L-T-A, -A, and it's Academic Language Therapy Association, they have a list of tutors in their area across the state. Excellent. And they can reach out to their teachers. Some teachers do tutor on the side. They can't tutor the students in their classes, but they can tutor other students in the district. So um, they can look into that. All right, excellent. We have a wonderful question. Somebody believes that they may have dyslexia and wanted to know how you learned that you had dyslexia. So, um, you can go get tested at a testing site. Uh, it's expensive. The way that I found out, and I was blessed, is whenever I became a dyslexia therapist, we had to practice the tests on each other. So um, when we did mine, they were like, whoa. <laughs> so, uh, but I already knew what the characteristics. I did not know I was dyslexic. I just knew, and I usually say this at the beginning of my presentation, the sentence I have said and spoke over myself my entire life is I'm smart enough to know I'm stupid. I knew I was dumb, so I knew going into stuff that I would get something confused or not be able to read or, or misinterpret a question. And so when I studied dyslexia, I had all the, I was looking at the characteristics like, oh my gosh, I am all of these. And so then when we did the C-top on me, uh, the KBID, I mean, I, I did all the tests when we were just practicing with each other. So I don't have a formal identification. I just have my friends um, scoring my test. Excellent. All right. Um, so we had a question about dyslexia and our current state of virtual learning. Um, is printing material a better course of action? This parent is finding that her daughter is overwhelmed with the technology. Um, not just her daughter. Uh, I am right there with her daughter. Uh, it is very difficult. My poor director, I have to call and say, I need you to say it to me. Like I'll read the email and I print it out and I highlight it, but then I need oral accommodation for him to verify that is what I understood. And I am classic. Uh, like I have a meeting. It says first, it was session one, June 23rd, but my brain read June 1st every single time I read it. Um, so those are the kind of things that with dyslexia, I, I, I will read it wrong. 
So I have to print stuff out, highlight it, and go over it, and sometimes change the font or have myself, I read out loud to myself, or I have to touch it with my finger. Otherwise, I, I get lots of things confused with print. The first, well, and my son is in college, and he's over here doing the same thing. He's like, Mom, it's so hard for me to learn virtually. And I said, I'm the same way. So yes, I found a lot of us are struggling. Okay, so here's a good question. After finishing the Take Flight Dyslexia Therapy program, should dyslexia-specific testing be done regularly to see how the student is doing, or just looking at the typical MAP and IR, IRI tests? Is that enough? Oh, that one's kind of hard to answer. So um, an assessment for dyslexia is not to be ever done again. The handbook says once dyslexic, always dyslexic. You do not need to be reevaluated for dyslexia. Um, so that, if that's what you meant, no. Progress monitoring and seeing where you're at, you constantly need to be with them because, like I said, content and connection with the teachers, you may need different accommodations. Um, it's the first time your child's learning a new subject once they get middle school and high school or there's multisyllabic words in history and they're needing more support. It's not that they're, they've digressed, it's that you're exposing them to something new and they've got to learn how to decode, relearn, organize and manipulate the whole, the part to whole. So dyslexia hasn't gone away, they just need strategies. And also dyslexic kids, like I don't think I'm dysgraphic, but the more I've learned about dysgraphia in the handbook, it is working with grammar and semantics and syntax inside of a sentence. And I, that's where I struggle when I write. My thinking and my application and my creativity is, is wonderful but I struggle with the writing. So, and you're like, what is she talking about? But you can finish Take Flight or finish any program. You still have dyslexia in ways that you will still need support and progress monitoring. So if, if usually their measures are like, how's the child do on STAR? What is the teacher reporting? Are they able to get the information in? Where are they struggling? So your IRI, that's what I think you mean is IRI. That's their reading fluency. I love IRI tests. I love letting my kids gauge where they're at and letting them know what do you want to build and building the fluency. But I also suggest with my parents and my students, what is my goal? If my students' fluency is below what I had hoped, but they are audio listening and turning in reports and turning in papers, I have to look at each child individually of what my goal is for them, where they were and where they're headed and what I want for them. So I don't blanket answer that statement because literally every one of my students, I had a different um, measure for them and where they were at. That answer that, I don't know if that was too vague. I hope it, anyone's welcome to reach out to me by email or phone call and we can deliver, let go specifically through your kid. No, oh, excellent. We've had a couple of parents ask for you to um, tell us what the acronym ALTA means because they uh, missed that part. Academic language therapy association thank you <laughs> well i could have said it i could have said it so uh, who knows <laughs> so many acronyms in special so many. yes um, so a parent has asked you mentioned some sight word lists do you have some lists for parents that they could use at home to help their students you can google it there's two kinds there's fries F-R-Y apostrophe S or Dolch. And um, both of those, uh, you can use either one. All they've done is they take the most high frequency words and they put them in order that you see them. And the first ones are like I and is the, and then it goes all the way. Fry's has, I think, a thousand word list. And Fry's also has a phrase portion. I, I, I found that after I was in the classrooms, but it's one I would have used. And it's, tip, it's common phrases. So in the or went to. So that way the students start seeing that in developing phrase so they can read in chunks or phrases, which develops fluency. Excellent. So lots of people wondering what to do over the summer. Do you have any workbooks? Would you suggest private therapy? What recommendations do you have to support a student over the summer? So I will say this about everything I do, you have to have balance. Um, 
one of my examples I give out because I was an athlete is uh, the splits. So I usually ask everyone in my audience, how many of you can do all three splits, right leg, left leg, and middle? Very few people say they can. Um, I said, okay, so let's say that to graduate from my school, you have to do all three splits. So if you're not good at it and you're like, no, 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 my hips don't do that, or I have a muscle disorder, or my legs are really tight, I can't, or I had an injury, I'm really sorry, you're gonna go into a room five days a week, put your leg against the wall and do the splits, all three. Oh, and in your summertime, you're gonna do it all over again. So I give that example so that parents understand that unless the attitude is right and the emotion is right and the perspective is right, too much in the summer does not give your child a break so they're ready for the next school year. So you've got to be very mindful of what is right for your kid. And I, unless you know that child, unless, you know, I can't recommend what's right. Know where your child's at. The most important thing is that they love learning. So audiobooks is one of my favorite things to do in the summertime for kids. My sight word list, if your kid is kinder through third grade, I would do my sight word challenge because that helps increase. Um, I'd get them stimulating something that they enjoy. If your child loves to bake, they're reading, right? If your child loves crafts, they're reading. So start highlighting and using those strategies inside of an area that brings them talent. If they love basketball outside, then you do some spelling words with the, with the basketball. There's lots of ways that your child is developing skills without it feeling like it. One of my best favorite compliments is I had a, a student that told her grandma said, you know, Mrs. D is really sneaky because we're learning and we don't even know it. <laughs> so that's kind of what you want to do in summer. You want them to enjoy it and not dread it. They want to be like, well, that was like the best summer I've ever had. And you were developing those skills. Plus those workbooks that I showed you, that IQ game, part to whole drawing. If your child is doing that part to whole drawing, you are developing dyslexia because what we're doing with words is we're taking a root word and we're adding a suffix and a prefix. We're taking a tiny part and we're adding them to make something greater. So there's stuff that you can do that can develop it without them feeling like they sat down and decoded. They sat down and they were spelling. Those are good things. I'm not being disrespectful. Those are good things. But you want summertime to replenish them because school's hard. So make sure you're blending it with some fun stuff. Bubbles, connect for, there's ways that you can help with spelling. And Nessie, I hate to just shout out a company, but Nessie has some really great uh, cartoons that have to do with um, uh, parts of sounds, phonemic awareness. And so a lot of kids that don't realize that they're learning because it's fun. So that's another one to look into. Excellent. We're going to go ahead and wrap up. We're at 1.30, so we want to respect your time, Nancy. So we want to go ahead and wrap this up. Thank you so much. If you still have questions, feel free to reach out to Nancy. We put her contact information in the chat box. You can also reach out to us at Partners Resource Network with any questions that you have. We have regional coordinators all over the state who would be happy to help answer any of your questions and assist you in this process. So we're gonna go ahead and wrap up for today so we can move on. Uh, again, if you're needing a certificate of attendance, you're going to be receiving an email tomorrow as a thank you for attending today. And there's going to be a link there that you can pull a certificate of attendance so that you can get that certificate if you're needing that. And Christina has pulled up our contact information for our Partners Resource Network. So you can reach out to Christina, our Director of Statewide Services. You can reach out to myself, Stephanie, the Training and Evaluation Specialist, or to our Support Specialist, Chelsea. We can get you connected to a regional coordinator in your area and help answer the questions that you have. So if you had questions that didn't get answered today and you'd still like to reach out to us, please reach out to us for those questions. We're happy to help you in any way that we can. And we want to thank you again for joining us and hope you have a wonderful day. And Nancy, thank you so much. I was taking notes and I have so many things I want to share with parents to help them as well. So thank you so much for that information. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for having me.